As South Africans lurch from one crisis to another, a recent reprieve in load shedding in the form of lower stages of blackouts has given us time to focus on other things. But lest we forget that during the first five months of this year, over 13 gigawatts were shed compared to 12 gigawatts during the whole of 2022. And with at least two more months of winter to go, what are the chances that the lights are going to stay on? This is no ordinary Wednesday. It's our in-depth look at what's driving markets, shaping the economy and changing the game. It's good to have you with us. I'm Jeremy Max. To analyze our load shedding outlook and factors that will influence availability in coming months, I'm joined by Investec equity analysts Herbert Karibe and Ross Kricher, who gave their predictions in a recent energy sector review. Herbert, Ross, a warm welcome to No Ordinary Wednesday. Herbert, let's wade straight in if we can. And probably what is top of mind for everybody, we have mercifully seen some easing in the load shedding schedule in recent weeks. I'm asking myself, is this a sign of better times to come or just calm before a very cold winter storm? Thank you, Jeremy. Always good to be back. I think uh, this winter is probably as ugly as it gets. The reduced load shedding in June was call it a pleasant surprise. While we somewhat anticipated the EAF improvement due to lower plant maintenance, all of which is seasonal, we didn't forecast gale force winds in the capes, which have boosted wind generation. And the big surprise for us is the lower than usual demand. We are two gigawatts light in terms of demand compared to the same period last year. So the next effect, call it three stages of load shedding better than what we had initially thought or forecast. But again, we are a month into winter, two to go, so too soon for a call it a victory dance. So too soon to do the victory dance, I absolutely accept that. And as we're recording this podcast, we need to factor in the whole predictability thing because this morning, uh, just before we started recording, we went instantly from no load shedding at all, suddenly to stage three. So we're going to have to live with that unpredictability, I think, for quite some time. But enough of that. Let's focus, if we can, Herbert, on the past, if we can. Let's take a step back. Explain to us how we got here. Just a few months ago, we were talking about 12 hours, maybe more of no electricity, comparing 22 to 2023. It's not a pretty picture overall, is it, if you take a longer, more elongated view? So quite correct. And I think to make sense of, let's call it the darkness, the how is well documented. But for our listeners' sake, the story goes as far back as the 90s and the 2000s. We did not invest timely on uh, generation capacity. And as a result, we had to run our fleet of plants a lot harder than we should to make up for the lack of new capacity. Intuitively, that should have prompted more maintenance, but rather the opposite materialized. We were not prudent with maintenance for a multitude of reasons, and our luck eventually ran out. We need to replace boilers and turbines. We just have not done that. Last year, we lost Kusile units one to three, call it a poor design. The units shed a chimney, so when we had one explosion in the other. We had to take out all three units. And this coincided with higher seasonal plant maintenance in the warmer summer months. And as luck should have it, or rather lack thereof, all the many years of irregular and ineffective maintenance came to roost, leading to an energy availability factor of around 49%. And for reference purposes, the target is 75%. So there's absolutely no doubt that in many respects, notwithstanding the current problems, we are paying for the sins of the past. I want to talk very quickly, and Ross, I'm going to bring you into the conversation right now, but I want to talk about ESCOM's energy availability factor. Please explain to us, if you can, in layman's terms, why this is such an important key measure and whether ESCOM's plans to raise it to pre-2022 levels, if I understand that correctly, is actually feasible or not? So a good place to start is what is energy availability factor or EAF as I will refer to it. EAF simply asks the question, is the unit available to produce energy? Let's use an employee 
as a reference who shows up to work. He or she is available to work, but they could be unavailable because they are ill. So let's call that unplanned downtime. Or they could go away on a lovely holiday. Let's call that planned maintenance. For ESCOM, the units are predominantly unavailable because they are ill. So what needs to be done to make our employee more available to work? In this case, we need to increase plant maintenance. We need to replace the boilers and turbines. And in our report, we did outline that more than half the fleet has exceeded their boiler and turbine design life. So on the back of that, not surprising that at least 40% of the faults last year could be traced back to boilers and turbines. To our knowledge, at this point, this has not been addressed and uh, it is quite difficult to make a case for a sustained improvement in the EAF if the required maintenance has not happened. And further, there are rogue elements at play and at this stage, quite unclear how much of the EAF can be explained by those rogue elements. Okay, Herbert, sit tight for the moment. I'll get back to you in a second. Ross, talking about people coming to work. Uh, welcome to the podcast. It's your first time with us. Let's talk about funding or lack of funding as far as this equation is concerned. There's absolutely no doubt that it's one of the huge stumbling blocks when it comes to that uh, EAF that Herbert was referencing. So in that context then, what does the funding landscape look like in your opinion and where would the key concerns be? Thanks a lot, Jeremy. Great to be here. I think Herbert's reference is to ESCOM's ability to obtain funding. So I think that is the key constraint here and we'd expect that to remain the case going forward. I think from the private sector perspective, there aren't the same level of constraints and I'd say the funding landscape actually looks very conducive to supporting investment here with all the major banks keen to get in on the act. Firstly, the return profile for banks and other funders can look very attractive. Secondly, growing exposure here can help achieve ESG targets. Maybe using the bank's targets as a guide for how the banks see this playing out, you can see expectations are very high. A lot of plans in the pipeline. In terms of concerns, I think a lot will depend on regulatory and legislative developments and economic conditions. Anything that negatively affects the return profile and cost of capital of these projects can hold up progress. Ross, not a day goes by when we don't listen to some news about private power generation. I'm wondering to myself, though, there's a lot of talk, there's a lot of hype around it, but when are we actually going to start to feel the impact of this uh, so-called increased self-generation? Sure, Jeremy. So, yeah, I hear you, uh, and I think it has taken longer than people would have hoped, but the scrapping of the cap for private sector generation by the government has driven an acceleration in registered projects and imported panels, inverters, and batteries. So if you look at data from Sapvia, that shows that 1.7 gigawatts of capacity was registered with NERSA in 2022. Recall that the removal of the cap happened in July last year. An additional 2.8 gigawatts of registered projects have been lodged with Sapvia in the first quarter of 2023. So there's clearly a, a real acceleration in the registration of these projects. If you look at ESCOM's data showing project status, you can also see projects with capacity that is greater than one megawatt in excess of 40 gigawatts in total have been tabled. Our base cases that are around five gigawatts of these projects can be operational by the end of 2025. Beyond these large scale projects, we also think household and commercial rooftop solar could add another one and a half gigawatts of capacity per annum for the next couple of years at least. So we could see something like 10 gigawatts of private sector capacity up and running by the end of 2025, which equates to around two to four gigawatts of effective capacity. So there certainly is some movement in the right direction and interesting to see that you cannot drive uh, through the suburbs these days and you look at roofs of houses and uh, you just see the sun reflecting off solar panels the whole time. So good to see that there is some uh, progress in that respect. Obviously, we need to start seeing the benefits of that progress sooner rather than later. We are going to continue this important conversation in just a moment. It's one that is driving every single conversation in South Africa right now, I would contend. I just want to remind you that uh, if you're enjoying the program, please take a moment to rate our channel, Investec Focus Radio SA, on your podcast channel of choice. So Herbert, let me bring you back into the conversation and let's start talking about solutions if we can. You've laid out very succinctly how we got here, what the challenges are, but obviously we ask ourselves each and every day, what is next? We ask ourselves as we are at that four-way crossing of traffic lights and everyone is going at the same time, we say to ourselves, well, 
what needs to happen now. So in your opinion, then, what key measures need to be taken, hopefully in the short term, that can get us out of this mess? Jeremy, I think as a country, we have not demonstrated that we have the political will to address the very well-documented challenges at ESCOM. Therefore, unlikely that ESCOM will get us out of this dark situation. The remaining solution, therefore, is private generation. I think there is some concession by government that private generation is a key part of the solution. I think some of the initiatives we've seen include the removal of the private generation thresholds. Government is working on willing and dealing tariffs. And at residential level, we've seen some tax allowances and at business level, quite generous tax breaks. I think that's quite a good start and we are likely to reap the benefits quite soon. So, Ross, it's a more conducive atmosphere then or landscape as Herbert is laying out for us. Within that paradigm then, I'm going to suggest to you that there must be excellent funding opportunities. Absolutely, Jeremy. I think there are. The major opportunities in the private sector, in our view, for the banks relate to large-scale embedded generation projects and household and smaller commercial-scale solar projects. So some of the work we've done suggests potential capital spending of over 300 billion rand over the next two and a half years, of which on balance sheet debt funding for the banks could be over 200 billion rand, which equates to about 4% of current gross loan books across the big four banks at December 22. In the longer term, this number could be much larger if reform is further accelerated and the transmission infrastructure is expanded. For example, ESCOM's 2022 transmission development plan suggests 53 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity would be required by 2032. So if you extrapolate that alone, that gives you a sense of what sort of capital spending and funding requirements we might see. And that also excludes other opportunities, for example, storage. Herbert, all very well. But in this entire conversation, it is all predicated on speed of solution. You've said in your note that the rollout of large-scale renewables is too slow. In what respect and why do you think this is happening? We could discuss funding constraints or ideologies, but it all boils down to political will. We know the challenge that is set before us, and I think to a large extent you cannot separate energy from the politics of the day. The government of the day is not singing from the same hymn sheet regarding their solutions to the problems that we face. And as a result, we have a much slower rollout than what is possible. For example, we knew of the grid constraints probably three to five years back. But to this end, we have not made the required investments. And in the bid window six, unfortunately, we turned down 4.1 gigawatts of renewable wind capacity due to grid constraints. So to a large extent, and this has to do with uh, political will. As Ross was telling us, though, there is progress, albeit on a small scale. And to your point, it is slower than ideal. But the reality is we are seeing a surge over time in self-generation projects. Surely this is going to lead to a more competitive electricity market or these entities just simply too small to make any difference? So definitely a renewables uh, boom at play and it's going to move the needle with time. We estimate by mid-2025 the summer-winter peak differentials likely to widen. What do we mean by that? That is peak demand in uh, winter which is normally around call it 35 maybe 36 gigawatts and summer, on the other end, around low 30s, call it 32, we think that probably widens to 4 gigawatts. That creates ample opportunity for ESCOM to carry out much-needed maintenance. So definitely going to move the needle with time. We just need to reach critical mass, which we think comes in sometime in mid-2025. And just a final question, what's the load-shedding outlook going to be for the next 18 to 24 months? I think 24 months out. We're probably looking stage one, maybe stage two. And we are really counting on all this project, at least most of them to have been connected into the grid. In the interim, we need Kusile units one to three to return. Probably Q4 this year, going into Q1 2024. And of course, uh, Medupi unit four as well with Kusile unit six. 
So a few milestones in between. But put simply, we are expecting things to significantly improve from here. We believe we are at the point of uh, maximum pain. June was a pleasant surprise. And we are hoping Lady Luck continues to smile in our direction. We are all holding thumbs as far as that's concerned. Thanks to both of you, Herbert Karibe and Ross Kricher, equity analysts at Investec. Leaves me to say that please join us again in a fortnight as we continue to explore money trends shaping your world. If you haven't yet added us to your podcast feed, pretty simple. All you need to do is search for Investec Focus Radio SA or wherever you get your podcasts. And all you need to do is hit that subscribe button. Until next time, goodbye from me, Jeremy Maggs, and the entire Focus Radio team. The views expressed are those of the contributors at the time of publication and do not necessarily represent the views of the firm and should not be taken as advice or recommendations. Investec Limited and subsidiaries, authorized financial service providers, registered credit providers, and long-term insurer.